Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> How lovely it is to be together. We sing Hine Matov on page 10. And in all transparency, Sarah, I need the remote thing so that people at home can see the... Thank you. <laughs> Words are on the screen too. <laughs> he Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Tonight, our Temple Emmanuel community joins with communities around our country and perhaps around our entire world in marking Refugee Shabbat. This is an initiative created by HIAS, the world's, I learned today, the world's oldest refugee agency. HIAS was originally founded in 1903 as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Its purpose was to help Eastern European Jewish immigrants settle into the United States. Today, HIAS is a multi-continent, multi-pronged humanitarian aid and advocacy organization with thousands of employees dedicated to helping forcibly displaced people around the world. We have a full service tonight featuring a powerful sermon by Cantor Weiss and heartfelt reflections from two of our Temple Emmanuel teens, Samantha Yugolnik and Ella Shamshal. This year, Refugee Shabbat falls during Parashat Yitro, the tour portion in which we experience revelation at Mount Sinai, where we receive the Torah at Mount Sinai. This portion is named Yitro after a person named Yitro, Moses' father, father-in-law, and he was also a Midianite priest. He brings vital wisdom to Moses and to the Israelites at a crucial moment at the beginning of their journey. Think about where we are in Torah during this week. We last week celebrated Shabbat Shirah, which means we read about and celebrated with music the crossing of the Red Sea and all of the dancing and celebration and music that happens after that. But right now, where we are is that the Israelites have just started their journey in the desert toward the promised land, and they are complaining and they are totally overwhelming Moses with all of their demands that they are putting on him day in and day out. As their leader, they're all going to him, and Moses is completely overwhelmed. So Yitro, his father-in-law, sees that this is happening, and Yitro says to Moses, what is this thing that you are doing to the people? Why are you acting alone while all of the people stand about you from morning until evening? The thing that you are doing is not right. You will surely wear yourself out and these people as well, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. You shall seek out all of the capable people in the camp, and you shall appoint them as judges to support you. Have the people bring every major dispute to you, but let these other, let them decide every minor dispute themselves. Make it easier for yourself by letting them share the burden with you. 
In this interaction between Yitro and Moses, we see the importance of learning from others, those who are different from us. And I bring a commentary by Rabbi Shai Held. He teaches, it is Yitro who tells Moses that the system he has set up for dealing with conflicts among the Israelites is untenable. One person cannot possibly handle such a Herculean task alone. He must appoint helpers. As soon as Yitro has offered his recommendation, the Torah reports simply that Moses heeded his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Just before one of the largest moments in our entire Torah, a moment of encounter with with God on the mountain just before the revelation of design of divine guidance for how Israel ought to live this big giant moment of our story our Torah stops to teach us what could be considered a small but important lesson there is wisdom among other nations among other people as we begin our Shabbat service tonight I'm going to ask you Two questions, therefore, to help us kind of frame what this refugee Shabbat is all about. If we start from the assumption that there is wisdom among the nations, if there was wisdom coming from Yitro, who was Midianite and he was not an Israelite, how should that shape our, rev- our relationships with communities and individuals who come from other nations, other cultures, and other backgrounds who are different from our own? What would have happened if Yitro hadn't been able to gain access to Moses? Or what would have happened if Moses hadn't been willing to listen to Yitro? Tonight we're going to hear the powerful stories about encountering the other, encountering strangers, people of other nations. I invite you to take these questions into your mind and into your heart as we honor Refugee Shabbat tonight. We'll begin our service with our lighting of our Shabbat candles. And to do that, um, I'd actually like to invite forward Ella and Sam and their families to come to our Shabbat candles right now and we'll, um, we'll light. The candles are on page two in our prayer books and just our prayer books, they look like this. They're toward the back of our sanctuary. I think everyone, or you can also follow along on the screen. Thank you. Yai lai 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 Yai lai 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 Yai lai 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 Yai lai 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 Just push really hard. You got this. And God told Moses to stretch. No. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu Bemitzvotav Vetsivanu Lehad Likner, Lehad Likner, Shel Before actually, Ella, you get too comfortable, I'm going to invite you back up to our bima. Um, we always start our service. We have a really nice tradition here at our temple of starting with a moment of Hazarat Hashavua, which means the reflection on our past week. So I'm going to invite Ella to share some powerful words about what she's been learning about in relation to immigration and refugee justice and some questions for you to ponder um, as we enter, as we say goodbye to this week and enter into Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. I'm Ella, and I'm in 11th grade. Um, This year, I'm going on the passport trip to Arizona to learn about immigration. 
And in our last class, we were asked, if we had to leave our homes right away and we could only take 10 things with us, what would those 10 things be? It wasn't easy coming up with only 10 things I could take with me. And I wondered, how could I choose just 10? It's hard to leave everything you know behind and start over. My mom had to do this when she escaped Iran to come here with the help of Hayas. For example, she has no pictures of her life before she left. As Jews, we are not unfamiliar with immigration, from escaping pogroms to escaping the Holocaust. Our history is riddled with having to leave our homes to start over. In light of our past, the words from Exodus resonate deeply with us. You shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the feelings of the stranger, having yourselves been strangers in the land of Egypt. This verse from Exodus highlights the empathy and understanding expected towards strangers, reminding us of the importance of kindness and compassion to those who are not in a land of their own. How can we as a community embody this teaching of compassion in our actions today? Thank you for listening. We'll continue with Shalom Aleichem, welcoming the angels of Shabbat on page 24. <clears throat> Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Hasharit, Malachi Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Boachem leshalom, Malachi hashalom, Malachi elyon. Mi melech, Malachi hamlachim, Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Baruch Hu ni leshalom, Malachi Shalom, Malachi Elyon. Mi melech, Malachi hamlachim, Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Say it, Hemle Shalom, Malachi Hashalom, Malachi. take a few moments um, to review your week, to think about those words that Rabbi Alvin opened with, that Ella so beautifully shared. And I, I guess my spontaneous prompt to everybody right now would be, where, what did you feel about walking into this service that is focused on uh, stories of the immigration crisis? And then check in with yourself now and perhaps you'll check in with yourself at the end of the service and see if your minds have shifted in any way. So we take a few moments of um, silent meditation. When I think about our people's historic rootlessness, our travels in diaspora, a history as almost permanent refugees, uh, I, I think about, and I agree with the writer Ahad Ha'am, who, who famously said that uh, more than Jews have kept Shabbat, Shabbat has kept the Jewish people. Uh, and I think also what's kept us is our occasions of joy, our occasions of simcha, um, no matter what our national condition has been, um, we've always made space for joy and for celebration. And so our tradition, our, our siddur, encourages us to treat the Shabbat, and to treat this, this moment right, ha right now in our service, uh, to treat Shabbat as a bride and to treat this moment as the, the receiving of the bride for a wedding. And, and I see in that 
an idea that whatever this week has been for us, whatever our conditions or circumstances have been, we have space, no matter what, for Shabbat, for rest, for joy, and we have space for peace. We welcome Shabbat with Lechad Odi on page 20. standing as we're called into the core of our prayer service with the ancient words that called people into prayer, called Jerusalemites and pilgrims alike into prayer at the temple in Jerusalem on page 28. <clears throat>
now that we're called in, we offer the words, these words that convey both our unique embrace and relationship to divinity and also our insistence on universal connectedness. Shema, page 34. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Shema like to invite up to our Bima, Samantha Ugolnik. She's going to be sharing a few words of her own before we go into Micha Mocha. Hi. <laughs> um, so for years at Temple Emanuel's Religious School, I would hear about these trips that our Madris would go on. And now, being their age, I'm able to attend these trips. And so I always thought that these trips were like fun, that you could go on as a teen, but I've learned that they are much more. And for example, through my classes, I have learned about immigration and how we as Jews can relate. We read a passage from the Torah that says, as Jews, we should welcome in strangers, provide for them, because we have been through their struggles. At first, I didn't really resonate with this quote because growing up in the heart of LA, one inherently avoids strangers. But as, as I've like, taken this quote more in, I've, 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 I've liked it more, I've resonated with it more. Um, we learned about the struggles of getting through and registering for admission through the country. We talked about the lack of conditions and the discrimination against immigrants. And although we may look different or sound different, we're all human underneath. On the American Jewish Experience trip, we traveled to New York City to see Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty, along with a tenement house tour that helped us see the conditions that our ancestors had to, tr had to experience when getting through the country. Um, we talked about Jewish migration and how over years and years, Jews have had to flee and move in hopes of a better life. Uh, next weekend, I will travel to with our passport program to the Arizona-Mexico border and see how the issue of immigration and refugee justice plays out there. I am excited to see a different perspective of immigration and what it looks like more often in modern day America. Uh, this will be another opportunity to learn about this issue through a Jewish lens and hopefully make long lasting memories. Uh, immigration is an issue that impacts all people, including Jews, and this is why we take time to learn about immigration and the issue in our religious school and why we're celebrating it here today. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Thank Shalom. So Shabbat Shalom. So as Samantha and Ella have so beautifully shared, the story of immigration is, is our story. And we're about to sing me Hamocha, which celebrates kind of the moment where we go from being a, a people enslaved in Egypt, which was by no means a place we wanted to stay. We didn't want to stay enslaved in, in that land, but it was a safe place. We got food. We were alive, right? But we made the trek as a people out into the wilderness, into the unknown, into the scary place for a better life. And so we celebrate that, <coughs> that, that which is within us as Jews as we sing Micha Mocha now. Micha Mocha is on page 40. Micha Mocha Oh, 
Israelites left Egypt inspired but battered, broken in so much pain, as we read last week. And this week, as Rabbi Alban discussed, we, this is our first, first week after escape. And this week we read about what comes next, the first steps of the healing of Jew, the Jewish people and of the Jewish persons. People in our world right now are all kinds of broken and all kinds of hurt, and we wish for them so many various kinds of healing. We turn to page 253 to offer our words of Misha Berach. We'll sing the first verse together, and then I'll pass my hand across the congregation to gather the names of anyone in your hearts and minds whom you're thinking about who needs healing, and then we'll continue together on the second verse. Jake Broder, Jill Kahn, Megan Cavallari, Eitan Chaim, Woody Clark, Pearl Councilbaum, Mimi Feldman, Judy Fenton, Tanaz Fulati, Dr. Benjamin Graham, Andy Hale, Helene Hale, Kathleen Agnes McCarthy, Sheila Merowitz, Yonatan Ben Esther, Howard Rosen, David Silber, Lindy Sobel, Mambube Soleimani, Helena Wachtel, Freddie Wolf, Michael Wolin, Andy Wu, and Howard Zelikow. Paulette Miller, Grace Blaustein, Lois Lebanon, Rita Newman, Audrey and Judith Venice, Lupe Diaz, Hazel Sequenza, Merrill and family, Andy and Helene, Lucia Diaz, and Kathy Murray.
bless those in need of healing with refua shlema, the renewal of body, the renewal of spirit, and let us To the Amidah in our service, we will turn to page 46. This is the part in our service where you may want to pay attention to the words that are in the prayer book, but it's also a really nice time for you to just be one with the divine above and say your prayers out into the universe. We start by singing Adonai Sifatai Tiftach, may God open up our lips so that we can pray. We'll sing that together and then we'll continue with our own silent prayer. Page 46, please rise. Adonai Tzvatai Tiftah Adonai Tzvatai When you've completed your prayers, you may be seated. Come on, 
January 23rd, I stood in a shelter in Tijuana with nine other members of our highest delegation to witness the faces behind the immigration crisis at our border. This is just one story that I heard. I am Maria Rosa. I am 25 years old. I have three kids, 11 years, eight years, and four years old. I started my journey in Honduras, and I traveled with my husband and my three kids by foot to the U.S. border. With tears in her eyes, she said, my husband, he was killed along the way. We just buried him. She pulled her hands out of the safety of her pockets, seemingly showing us her fingers, and spoke with the translator hovering behind her. I have a genetic hand disorder, and my youngest son does too. And with tears, she said, he gets teased. I found it intriguing that this was a part of her story too. But she continued, I applied for an appointment on the CBP-1 app, the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol Pr Protection app. Now I'm just waiting for my appointment. It's been two months. I heard that there's a very small chance that I would be granted citizenship in the United States. But all I can do is hold on to that 1% chance that I will make it. That my children will live a better life than me. That my husband's life was the ultimate sacrifice for a better life for my children. I live with hope. No matter how many people and countries tell me that I won't make it, I choose to believe. Standing at the Madre Asunta shelter in Tijuana, I heard this story directly from Maria Rosa. And I gazed up in the courtyard where she told her story. And I saw dozens of women and children from Africa, Afghanistan, and Mexico waiting for the day that they would finally get a chance. I stood in disbelief that a room full of 30 tightly squished bunk beds and a few nicely cleaned but outdoor toilets represented the safe haven many of these women had had in months, the first safe haven that they had had. So tonight, I want to ignite your curiosity. You can, of course, get the statistics on the news. You can hear about the quote-unquote border crisis on the radio. But it's hard, to me, it's hard for me to feel empathy for numeral statistics that I hear. I, I needed these real-life stories. 
Most of us hear about the border crisis these days as a political point of contention, right? That's how we hear about it on the news. But it's more than that. It's more than just keeping out the fentanyl and the bad guys, which of course is important. And it's about protecting innocent people who are quite literally fleeing their worst nightmares. I fear that the decisions being made or not made over the next year are more focused on electability and less on humanity. So I stand here today giving this sermon as what will be perceived as probably my most political sermon, not that I give that many, but I hope that it is actually perceived as my most empathetic one. More than any of my cantorial duties, I see my pastoral care as primary, whether it's in using my heart to sit with someone in a hospice or using my singing voice to uplift people in deep prayer. My first desire as a cantor is to be at one with you. It's my job to open up my ears and my heart and hear the stories of our people. On Shabbat, we cease from petitioning God. That is, we stop asking God for things and instead, we're supposed to sit back and praise God. Or at the very least, we're supposed to be grateful. But how do we reconcile this concept on a Shabbat in which we're supposed to highlight the refugee crisis? How do we not ask God for change and instead praise the majesty of the energy that connects us? How do we not sit here in judgment about whose fault this mess is or which side of the aisle is most to be blamed. Tonight, I just urge you, just sit and ask, who is Maria Rosa? What was her life like before she left Honduras? Sit in reflective questioning, not judgment. The immigration crisis is larger than any one of us can imagine. For me, asking questions and simply absorbing the facts is my gateway towards compassion. The entire time that I was on the delegation, I couldn't help but to be curious about the journey that so many immigrants took in order to just get to our border. What do you mean? You walked? You, you walked from Honduras to Guatemala to Mexico? You took a bus, but then a coyote robbed you of your money and your passport? You got sex trafficked? And the most mind-boggling fact and anecdote that I heard was that women chose to take birth control in anticipation of their journey, knowing that they were vulnerable to rape, violence, but they still, they still chose to take this journey because it is better, believe it or not, it was better than what they had to leave behind. Just imagine being an innocent person, fleeing a war-torn country, only to experience even worse nightmares on your way to freedom. So I ask myself, okay, but why? Why should we, as a community, why should I, as a cantor, focus our resources on the global immigration crisis. Our trip was led by our very own Rabbi Sarah Bassin, who served here for nine years. And she's now the director of clergy and congregations for Hyas. I asked Sarah, Sarah, you know Temple Emanuel. What do I tell them? Why should we focus a quarter of our resources on, of our social action resources on the crisis at the border. Her answer, because Lizzie, this isn't just a crisis at the border. This is a matter of global stabilization. For the first time in our human history, there are 117 million forcibly displaced people in our world. The number is only rising. And unless we globally figure out how to manage and care for the people fleeing for their lives and the crisis that caused them to flee, we can only expect to see increasing xenophobia, toxic nationalism, and broken systems set up for failure. 
But I just say, if we don't help the Maria Rosas of the world, who will? I want to help raise her children so that they can be thriving parts of our community. The question isn't how do we keep them out, but how do we allow good people with unfortunate circumstances in? Guided by the amazing, knowledgeable staff of Hyas. By the way, there were five members of Hyas on our tour with us. We had Rabbi Bassin. We had a director of security. We had um, an attorney, a, an immigration attorney who serves as the policy advisor for Hyas, standing with us. I was very blessed to be surrounded by such knowledgeable people. But we became really keenly aware that what happens in Somalia affects what happens in Colombia. What happens in Venezuela affects what happens in Guatemala. What happens in Honduras affects the bottleneck of refugees and asylum seekers trying to just seek refuge in the United States. They said this over and over again. We just need to create a predictable and boring protocol to access the USA. Ultimately, this will help Israelis fleeing rockets and Jews fleeing anti-Semitism around the world as it is, as we know, globally on the rise. We don't live in a bubble. And stabilizing the immigration process in America is critical to balancing the inevitable evils that drive out millions of displaced people around our entire world. Rabbi Bassin further explained as a message our southern border is no longer seeing just Mexicans and Hondurans and those that we've typically expected from Latin America. We're now seeing Africans, Russians, Chinese, Afghans, U Ukrainians. If we do not show leadership on this, how can we expect other countries to? We were given the immense opportunity to witness the faces and places behind the immigration crisis. This is where I want to share with you what I saw on this journey. We went to two shelters in Tijuana. We saw the people who were doing the right thing, right? They were at a shelter in Mexico waiting for an appointment. We also saw angels on this earth, people in Mexico trying desperately to just provide and support for the immigrants who stand in front of them. We had the, I don't know if you would say privilege, but we were dropped off by bus in Tijuana as we toured. And then we were dropped back off at the port entrance and told to walk back through. And honestly, to me, it felt like a global entry experience or coming back you know, at an airport. That's what it felt like. But then I looked at the line next to me with the Mexican National Guard who are literally holding back a line of immigrants trying to get in. Perhaps they were waiting for their appointment, but there were armed Mexican National Guards keeping them out. So I hope that as I continue to unfold these stories of my experience, you're perhaps asking, okay, I get it, I get it, but what am I supposed to do to help? And how can we in Beverly Hills help? So there are unbelievable organizations on the ground already doing their best to serve immigrants around the world. I had no idea, but who has heard of JFS, Jewish Family Service? Thank you, yes, we have big representatives here. JFS of San Diego, serves as one of the largest rapid response shelters in all of California in San Diego. I can't tell you what pride that that gave me and what pride it should give all of us to know that this Jewish organization is literally providing shelter and food and backpacks and just anything that people can need when they arrive on the border. And the first thing they see is Jewish Family Service of San Diego. We don't have to build a new process. We can support theirs. That's what I want to tell you today. Every night, 300 people arrive at the JFS San Diego shelter. 
As I said, they're treated with kindness. They're treated with dignity. They're, I, I couldn't believe as I walked into the room, you know, there was a room where we could help make snacks, snack bags and stuff like that. And then we were introduced to three lawyers sitting there who are literally there to just help people to fill out their asylum application, which I believe you need a PhD in, Im in immigration crisis to fill out an asylum application. They say that at the end, an asylum processing application can be 300 pages. You have to have proof. I didn't write this, but let me just tell you, you have to have proof who you are. How is your country unsafe for you? And you can't just say, I'm facing economic poverty. You can't just say, my, there's war in my country. You have to show that you personally are at risk. There is someone out to kill you or to hurt you. So we can support other organizations, other nonprofits who are already on the ground, and they've been doing this work for dozens and dozens of years. <coughs> As both of our teens wonderfully said, in Leviticus it says, you must love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Just after the Israelites experienced their first taste of freedom, along their journey to Mount Sinai, they experienced their first war. Amalek came and fought with Israel. That's from Exodus 17 verse 8. But with the divine intervention of God working through Joshua and Moses, and let's be honest, a little bit of voodoo magic, they survived. So who will be the Joshua of our immigrants today? Who will do the work of Moses for our huddled masses yearning to breathe free? Let us be catalysts for change. Let us serve as a sanctuary. As our trip was coming to a close, one of the rabbis brought an interesting text to our closing circle. It, it happened to actually be on Tu B'Shvat, the birthday of our trees. He reminded us of this Perkei Avot teaching that this land doesn't belong to us or to any owner except for God, for the original creator, ki li kol ha'aretz, it says, for the land is mine. Why? For you are all but strangers and temporary residents with me on my land. You, humanity, may be currently dwelling on this land or that land, but it's all temporary. This land belongs to me. So if the land is not mine or yours or theirs, then it's ours to take care of for the brief time that we're here. As we stood there on Tu B'Shvat, the birthday of the trees, we were reminded that the stars and the moon and the trees and the sun and the seas can be longer witnesses of how we occupy this earth. That we have to remember that being hospitable, welcoming people is at the core of what it means to be Jewish. And let's not let our own selfishness and unrealistic ownership of the soil that we sit on be reminders that we only live once. Let's make better choices. So I urge you all, as our temple moves forward with our newly named social action committee, you might have seen mitzvah makers, but now it'll be, everything will be under the umbrella of the Emanuel Mitzvah Corps. Join me as we do work at home, in our backyard, at our border, and abroad. There is too much to learn, and I am here tonight simply to be a messenger for the amazing work of Hyas today. On this Shabbat, let your curiosity guide you to empathy, understanding, and kindness. This year's Refugee Shabbat is a moment for congregations, organizations, and individuals around the globe to rest and reflect, to celebrate the impact of our work, and to recommit ourselves to the creation of a more just, welcoming, and compassionate world. We say Shabbat Shalom. 
Let's close with those words, Ve'ahavta l'reecha kamocha. Ve'ahavta l'reecha kamocha, l'reecha kamocha, kamocha. Ve'ahavta How would the world look? Uh, we begin now to end our service. Um, with words of gratitude for the, the mission of our people of Israel um, that Cantor Weiss referenced, um, the mission that includes these values uh, and ideals and also the charge uh, that we should act on them. So we turn to Alenu on page 282. 282. Alenu le Shabbat Ladon Hakol La Take it Ulalio Shehuno Teshamayim Beyoset Aretz Umoshav Yikaro Bashamayim Mimaal Ushina Tuzo Begum Heme Romim Hu Eloheinu Einod Vaanachnu Korim Umishtachavim Umotim Lifne Melech Malachi Hamlachim HaKadosh Baruch Hu V'nemar V'haya Adonai L'melech al kol ha'aretz V'yom ha'hu V'yom ha'hu Yeh Adonai Echad U'shemo U'shemo Uh, our, our tradition's primary prayer of memory and mourning, uh, the Kaddish, seems to have come into this use from having been the thing that you say when you're done studying a tractate, a book, a section of Torah, a section of Jewish learning, you would say Kaddish. And that came out of the Beit Midrash into our sanctuaries um, when we pray as a way of, of mem remembering people in our lives. And it makes me think always, its use here makes me think of, you know, when you study a great book, you may, you may close it when you finish it, um, but the story lives on, the lessons live on, the memories live on, the presence of that experience of having read that, that book, of, of done that learning lives on. We are changed for having had that encounter, so too with the people we remember in our lives. If you are here tonight because you're observing Shloshim, the first month following the death of a loved one, I invite you to now please rise and share their name with us. Can you share their name? We additionally remember as a community Dr. Kurt Altman, David Pick, Bobby Kay, and Maya Polishuk. If anyone here is observing Shana, the first 11 months of mourning following the death of a parent or loved one, I invite you to rise now and share their name. And if anyone here is, is here to observe a yard site, the anniversary of the death of a loved one, I invite you to rise now and share that person's name with us. Additionally, as a congregation, remember Zachary Zernick, Ellen Kaminsky, Philip Hirsch, Marilyn H. Friedman, Ruben Cabrins, and Oscar L. Paris. We also think of Fern Waller and Rita Green. Hold on. Uh, yes. 
in, I invite you to rise now in solidarity with these mourners among us in memory of these uh, members of our community who have passed, as well as for those who have no one to say Kaddish for them and all those whom we recall who have passed in recent times. The words of mourners Kaddish are on page 294. Yit Kadal, Yit Kadash me Rabbah, Beama di Brah Hirote, Beam Lich Mahute, the Hayahon of Yomehon, Uv Haye de Ho Beit Israel, Bagala of his man Kari Vemru Amen, Yehesh me Rabbah Mabarach le Lam Lame Almaya, Yit Barach, Vish Tabach, Vit Paar, Vit Romam, Vit Nase. Vit Hadar, Vit Ale, Vit Halal, Shme de Kudisha, Brihu, Le Ela, Minkol, Birhata, Vishirata, Tush Behata, Venehemata, Da Amiran, Belma, Vimru, Amen, Yehe Shloma, Rabba, Min Shemaya, Behaim, Alenu, Belko Israel, Vimru, Amen, O Se Shalom, Bimramav, Hu Ya Se Shalom, Alenu, Belko Israel, Belko Yashe Tebel, Amen. 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 May their memories be for so many blessings. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. My favorite time of the night. So uh, we're going to start with, uh, we only have four, four or five announcements, starting with this coming Tuesday night. Please join me. I am teaching a themed class kindness toward yourself. Our theme, I bet you all know by now, is <laughs> kindness for this year. And I think we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can be kind toward other people, which is, of course, extremely important. But I'm here to teach you that you can't be kind toward other people unless you're first starting with the foundation of being kind toward yourself. So our class is going to be examining what that means, what does our tradition have to say about self um, self-care, self-kindness, looking at yourself favorably as you do toward others. It's a text study and practice for this time of compassion fatigue, Tuesdays in February at 7 p.m. And only in person. Only in person. I'd like to clarify. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, next Thursday night, I'm very excited for this pink holla bake. If you don't want your holla to be pink, you don't have to make it pink. Is there actually going to be pink food coloring? I, I believe there is. Oh, wow. But considering that this is like a national program I th and it's a breast, ca <laughs> breast cancer awareness organization, I'm hoping they haven't chosen poisonous pink dye. But, you know. I sincerely hope so. That being said, we've had a great <laughs> response. We will have congregants sharing their story. There will be someone from Char Sherritt there also to share um, a little bit about their work and to be there to answer questions. Um, a couple of years ago, we did this, and I just learned so much in, in one night. So um, I, I'm sure we're going to close the RSVP soon. So if you're interested, please RSVP ASAP. Next Friday night, right? It is Oh, my Friday God, I night. can't. The, yeah. <laughs> next Friday night, we have Shabbat Spark at 615, or join us right before for little sparklers. If you have little ones who want to eat pizza and hear some blessings and very quick Shabbat at 5.15. Um, so Little Sparklers should have been first, but Little Sparklers at 5.15, and everyone's welcome to stay for Shabbat Spark. Okay, I'm, I'm excited because I, I'm just going to pat myself on the back and say I, I, I was the one who recommended <laughs> Emmanuel Feud. Last year we had a trivia night, and it was super fun. It is, right, uh, people here who played. So this year we have Emmanuel's Feud, like family feud. We went with a lot of different ways. I, I wanted to call it um, uh, Soros. Soros Mishpacha, Surat Mishpacha. Does anyone here know what Soros means? How Do does nobody know what Soros? know what Soros means? It's like... Raise your hand if you know what Soros is. We all have a lot of Sur No? Okay. This is kind of why we didn't go with that name. Well, <laughs> I think it was about 50%. So, anyways, I'm going to just call it uh, Mishpachat Soros. 
Okay, family feud. Um, anyways, join us on <laughs> February 23rd. There will be a cottage service before at 545. But um, join us. It will be a wonderful dinner. Um, we want to make sure everyone knows, even though the game is called Family Feud, we are your family. It's Emmanuel's feud. You do not have to be a part of a five-person family. I know I'm lucky I have seven people in my family. But um, you can come yourself, and we will build the teams. And last but not least, can we say Mazel Tov to Nima, who's right there, who's going to finally become Bar Mitzvah tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Woo, Nima! So join us for um, Shabbat morning at Emmanuel. Actually, we have one more announcement. Do we want to? Do you want to come up oh, and yeah. share? So Samantha <coughs> Ugalnik is a young woman of many talents, and not <laughs> only speaking about her powerful experiences in learning about immigration, she's going to share a little bit about our teen youth group, Tempty. She happens to be our president, and they happen to have an event tonight, and just generally what goes on with Tempty. So hi, uh, I'm going to talk on the event real quick. We are doing a gingerbread house building competition. So <laughs> if you know any eighth graders through 12th graders, they're free to come join us tonight, like right now. It's it's right right I know this is, really, this is a really short notice, I'm sorry. But just in general, if you know any eighth grade through 12th graders, they're free to join us. We are the Temple Youth Group. We meet once a month. We have food, we all just hang out, we play games. We hang out with other synagogues and their teen youth groups. We go on retreats. It's really fun. Interesting. Oh, and if you like, if you want to talk or get any info, you can <laughs> talk to me. You can talk to our advisor, Aaron Wiener. Who's yeah. Over there. <laughs> um, you can also follow us on Instagram at oh. Beverly Hills Temple Youth. So thank you for listening. Well, that was thank a great you. plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Last but not least. Um, is there anyone here for the first time? It's been like pre-pandemic since we've actually done this. But if you're here for the first time and you would like to stand up and introduce yourself, please do. No pressure, if not. Wow. But just know you're not a stranger anymore. No. <laughs> you're welcome in this space. Yeah. You're welcome in this space. And we'll talk to you after while we have challah. Okay. Canterweiss, what is our closing song tonight? That's a, actually a really good question because <laughs> I couldn't make things simple. I got my voice back and then I just had to. Full force. Full force, yeah. Um, I, I, I had this urge to sing Debbie Friedman's Tefillat Haderach. Many of us know it as just our prayer for journeys. And I think we do need to say a prayer for the journey of the immigrants, but I want to encourage us to say this prayer for us right now too, because we're also on this journey of trying to figure out how to heal the world right now. So we're gonna sing, may we be blessed, but let's include those strangers, let's include those uh, neighbors all around us. So if you wanna rise, put your arms around each other, you can see the words up on the screen, and we'll close our service with Tefillat HaDerech. May we be blessed as we go on our way. Amen. Second verse. May we be sheltered by the wings of peace. May we be kept in safety and love. May grace and compassion find their way to every soul. Our blessing. Amen. 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 May this be our blessing. Amen.
Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. We will do Motsiat Bahala in the back, so please join us for that. <laughs>